If you want to know just how much gravitas Belisarius carried in the 530s, you need to look no further than the situation in North Africa. The great general quickly conquered the Vandals in 533 and 534, but as soon as he left, trouble began to mount, accumulating in an all-out mutiny in 536, led by Stotzis. Belisarius was in Sicily at that time, but rushed south to hold what remained of the Roman army together before defeating Stotzis and his rebels at the Battle of Membressa. Belisarius then hurried back to Sicily to launch his invasion of Italy, leaving Africa in the hands of his sub-commanders. Stotzis was defeated after all. His army was dwindling, and Belisarius' very presence had kept many Romans from breaking rank and joining with the mutineers. But the commanders left in Africa were not Belisarius. Sure, they were capable officers, but they did not carry the same respect that the great general held. Belisarius might have been the only man who could hold the army together at this time, and that was a lesson that the Romans were about to learn the hard way. After Membressa, Stotus and his band of mutineers, Moors, and Vandals fled into Numidia, where a Roman army under Marcellus prepared to finish them off. As the two armies prepared for battle, Stotus approached the Roman camp and gave a stirring speech, reminding the soldiers that their pay was late, that they had not been allowed to take spoils of war, and that the leadership had probably siphoned money away from them. Stotus was airing grievances that he knew these men shared with him. No one was happy with the late pay. It's a big reason why the mutiny began in the first place. And Stotus was apparently a very gifted orator and a charismatic leader, the kind of thing that could be countered by a man like Belisarius, but not so much by lesser officers. Upon hearing the speech, the men began to abandon Marcellus, causing the general and his officers to seek refuge in a nearby church, only to eventually be killed by their own soldiers, who had now thrown in with the mutineers. The mutiny, which Belisarius thought he had put down, was back on. Back in Constantinople, Justinian had by now heard of the problems in his new prefecture, and he sent his cousin Germanus to clean everything up while Belisarius took care of business in Italy. There is some confusion about Germanus. Some sources cite him as Justinian's nephew, but the consensus among modern scholars is that he was the nephew of the Emperor Justin, who was Justinian's uncle and predecessor, and this would make him the cousin of the Emperor Justinian. Germanus had a long military career, having served as Magister Militum in Thrace, and he had also held an honorary consulship in Constantinople. Germanus embarked for Africa in the summer of 536, with orders to try to bring the mutineers back into the Roman ranks, rather than crushing them outright. These were still men that could fight, after all. Justinian wanted them on his side. To accomplish this goal, Justinian gave his cousin enough gold to bring everyone's pay completely up to date. When Germanus arrived in Carthage, he found that roughly two-thirds of the army had it deserted or joined up with Stotzis. So even if he wanted to try to crush the rebellion, he'd have had a very, very hard time. So instead, Germanus tried amnesty. He put out word that he was promising all of the soldiers their full back pay, even for the ones currently aligning with Stotzis. And he would even pay them for the time they spent in the rebel army. Germanus partially got this word out through the troops that had remained loyal. These men had been tentmates with the mutineers. They knew each other. They had fought together. They were friends. And 
they didn't want to do battle with each other. The bitterness wasn't between the soldiers. It was with the broken promises and the slow pay. And everyone was mad about it, even the men who remained loyal to the Emperor. So it wasn't difficult for Germanus to get these guys to spread this news for him. They would have been happy to bring their buddies back into camp. Because of this, the plan worked. Once the men under Stotus' command started hearing that they would get paid if they just returned to the Roman banner, they very quickly started coming home. Stotus could see his numbers dwindling rapidly, and he knew that he had to act. So he took the men that he still had and began to march towards Carthage. Germanus moved the men under his command out of the city to meet them. Stotus had promised his men that the loyalists in Carthage would abandon the Roman army and join their mutiny rather than fight their brethren on behalf of an emperor that had mistreated them. But Germanus had reminded his men that he was there to right the wrongs of the past and that their loyalty would not be forgotten or ignored. So when the two armies lined up, no one defected as Stotus had predicted they would. His men did not like this one bit and began an impromptu retreat back towards Numidia where their wives and their money were located. Stotus was quickly forced to retreat his entire army. Germanus followed and caught the mutineers at Scalavateris, where the two sides again prepared for battle. The Romans deployed with their elite cavalry on the wing under Germanus's personal command. The infantry was in the center, and the more inexperienced cavalry was on the infantry's right under the command of Ildiger, Theodorus, and John Troglita. As for Stotus's men, Procopius tells us that they were, quote, not in order, but scattered, more in the manner of barbarians, unquote. Which might just be a dig at Stotus and his ability to lead an army. But then there was a third army, lining up behind Stotus's men. And it was the Moors under Iudas. Iudas had promised his support to Stotus, but he was simultaneously negotiating with Germanus and also prepared to join his side. The Moors had done this dance before. During the Vandal War itself, it was their signature move by this point. So both Germanus and Stotus played the little game, talking to Iudas and agreeing to welcome his friendship, with both generals knowing full well that the Moors would likely wait for the battle to be decided before choosing which side to actually support. Stotzis initially wanted to attack the Roman left, where Germanus and his elite cavalry were lined up, but some of his subordinates convinced him to attack the Roman right, where the soldiers were more inexperienced and more likely to break. Stotzis accepted this reasoning and threw his best men at John and his cavalry. And sure enough, the Roman lines began to crumble, exactly as planned. But of course, Germanus wasn't going to just sit back and let that happen. He drew his sword and personally led his elite cavalry in a charge towards Stotzis. Meanwhile, Ildiger and Theodorus began squeezing the mutineers from the opposite side. The fighting here was extremely fierce, and confusion played a large role. The soldiers on both sides were Roman for the most part. They all spoke the same language, they had the same uniform, and they used the same equipment. It was nearly impossible to tell the armies apart, especially in the heat of battle. Germanus had anticipated that something like this could happen, and had previously given his men a password that they could use to identify themselves to each other during the fighting. Which was a pretty great idea, but it wasn't foolproof, 
and one of Stotus' men actually got close enough to Germanus to kill the general's horse. Germanus fell to the ground and was nearly killed himself, but was saved by the quick reaction of his bodyguards who were able to kill the assailant. The intense fighting continued, and gradually the Roman loyalists began to get the upper hand, with the mutineer lines beginning to break. When Stotus saw his men starting to fall apart, he began a retreat. And at this point, just as expected, the Moors finally decided to join in, siding with Germanus. They chased Stotzus and what remained of his army back into Mauritania. Stotzus would manage to escape and survive, with very few men still under his command. He would go on to marry a local chieftain and would proclaim himself a king claiming authority over an area of Mauritania. This would be the end of his mutiny, but it would not be the end of trouble in North Africa. While this was going on, back in Carthage, one of Theodorus' bodyguards, a man named Maximinus, had wanted to use this opportunity to seize power for himself and had started recruiting some men into a conspiracy. However, this plot was leaked to Germanus when he arrived back at the capital city, fresh off his victory over Stotzus. Germanus approached Maximinus and attempted to recruit him back into the emperor's ranks by giving him a position in his own personal guard. Maximinus accepted this position but secretly planned to use his proximity to the general to further his plot. Weeks went by, and on an agreed-upon day, Maximinus's men approached the palace in Carthage, where Germanus was enjoying his lunch. Maximinus was inside the palace, along with other members of Germanus's personal guard. The soldiers began to make demands of Germanus, asking for more money, citing the pay delays that they had endured all those months before the general's arrival. Germanus knew that something was up, and secretly ordered some of his most trusted guards to keep Maximinus under close watch, and to not allow him to leave the palace. Germanus then went to meet the angry soldiers personally, and was led to Carthage's Hippodrome, where many more men loyal to Maximinus were waiting. The plan was for Maximinus to be present at this point and to give the signal to kill Germanus at the appropriate time, and then Maximinus would take command. But, since Germanus had ordered his most trusted guards to keep Maximinus back at the palace, the conspirators could not proceed as planned. Germanus instead ordered his own soldiers to enter the Hippodrome, and caught the conspirators by surprise. They were quickly and easily defeated, either surrendering or being killed by Germanus' men. Maximinus himself would not escape punishment. Germanus had him put to death by ordering him to be impaled in front of Carthage's walls as a signal to any other would-be mutineers. These rebellions were going to end, and they were going to end now. No more compassion, no more amnesty. If you messed around, you would find out. By 539, the Roman army in North Africa had been put back into order. No more disgruntled soldiers, no more issues with pay, no more mutinies. And it was just in time, too because Germanus was about to be recalled to the east. The Sasanians were about to be on the move, and Belisarius was still finishing off the Ostrogoths. So a new governor would be sent to North Africa, allowing Germanus to come back to Constantinople, so that he could prepare for a campaign on the eastern frontier that was approaching far quicker 
than Justinian had anticipated. 